thank you for coming. Dude, thank you for having me, man. Candidly, everybody, I hit up Bradley. I said, dude, can I come on your show? Yeah, but I wanted you on for a while, honestly, for a long time. Um, for tons okay. of reasons. I mean, dude, I've watched you when I was growing up, and I, I think a lot of people probably can, can say the same thing. Um, I want to get right into it, though. Obviously, you sent me the like the kind of stand-up variety show type multimedia thing you sent. Yeah. And I watched probably the first seven minutes of it. I guess, like, what I'm so interested in you is, like, when you started all this shit in the very beginning, number one, how old were you when you first started, like, making content? Okay. And then number two, prior to you doing that, was there any examples of what you do not currently today, but when you first started yeah, being successful? Even. Yeah, uh, not even, man. Um, I uh, Like, where did the idea come from? Just to be like, I'm going to do this, the craziest, outlandish Skateboarding led me to the video camera. You know, like, but basically all skateboarders make videos of themselves doing tricks. 100%. I remember that those days. And there's really no other activity which lends itself to, uh, you know, being documented quite the way skateboarding does. Like, if you want to be a professional tennis player... Then you gotta win matches. You don't need to videotape anything. You just win. Yeah. Anything with sports, you just win. Like, if you think about it, man, I, I, I don't know of, of really anything except skateboarding that, like, you know, really, really involved, like, so much videotaping. And, and that like gave, lifestyle, right? Well, yeah, I mean, think before YouTube, you know, like, yeah. uh, I made my first videos with, uh, you know, cassette recorders, yeah. VCRs. Um, and, uh, that, that gave skateboarders a, a big uh, head start on video production. Like Spike Jones, the Academy Award winning movie director, yeah. his first video project was a skateboarding video. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't that great at skateboarding, but um, I just loved the way that the video camera allowed me to edit out failures and effectively manipulate people's perception of me. You know, yeah. you can just show the times when you made it. Yeah. And uh, the idea of, I don't know, just the idea of being able to exist in more places than you actually are because people are watching you, you know, like that blew me away. And I was always an attention whore. And, uh, you know, it was 1990 when I made my first video. I was one year old. One year old, there you go, uh, man. I was 15, so uh, 15 years old, I made my first video. Um, I went to the University of Miami when I was 18, and I just couldn't bring myself to go to class. I couldn't keep a job. Like I failed out of college, and I just thought, man, I don't have what it takes to survive in the world. You know, like can't, yeah. can't work, can't go to school. Like, I can't, like I'm just not going to make it. And uh, my only plan as I dropped out of the University of Miami was uh, I'm going to become a crazy famous stuntman by videotaping, you know, crazy stuff with, with the home video camera. You know what's so interesting? You said it, you started it by being like skateboarding and showing the highlights of when you win, yeah. like when you do good. Yeah. But your whole career is like showing all the <laughs> f***ed up shit. So, sure. Because I find it interesting because it makes sense. Like you've, I'm assuming you're filming skateboard stuff and you guys probably start f around. Like, where did the idea come out um, to be like, let's do this, like, outlandish shit? Well, the thing about skateboarding, um, it, like, from the very beginning, even skateboarders, even the most diehard skateboarders couldn't sit through an hour of nothing but skateboarding. It would just become tedious and monotonous. Yeah. So from the very beginning of skateboarding videos, they always had like comic relief to break it up. And, and that comic relief would be like really, really, uh, you know, reckless, wild, like just, you know, yeah. crazy, crazy. Shit. So, um, when, uh, when I was dropping out of college, I wanted to be like crazy famous stunt guy, but I still really loved skateboarding and I wanted to make it my mission to be that comic relief in skateboarding videos. And as it turned out, the first uh, like real 
I mean, I got some, I got a number of different skateboard videos, but the ones that were like the most impactful were made by this skateboarding magazine, Big Brother. And that they had the craziest crap in their videos. And the guy in charge of Big Brother magazine was Jeff Tremaine. And yeah. he, he in Knoxville reached out to Spike Jones. Spike Jones grew up with Jeff Tremaine in Maryland. And they said to Spike, they're like, dude, uh, people love our Big Brother videos, but nobody cares about the skateboarding. They said, we, th we think if we take out the skateboarding, just the crazy crap that's left over could be a TV show. And, and when you took out the skateboarding from Big Brother, you were left with Wee Man and Knoxville yeah. and Pontius and me. Yeah. So it's crazy that my lack of skill for skateboarding, <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, I'll just settle for being the crazy guy and, and uh, doing dumb stuff in the skateboarding videos. That would turn you out built an entire fun. life around it. Yeah, it turned out to be the thing. And, um, you know, going back to when, like, when I first started making content, yeah, I was 15. Um, 1993, I, I devoted myself to pursuing a path of just videotaping crazy stuff. And in 1993, I imagine that they had the real world by then, like the very first season. Is this when you were 18 then? Uh, in 1993, I had just turned, like when I dropped out of the University of Miami, I had just turned 19. Okay. Uh, yeah, I had just turned 19. And um, yeah, maybe they had real world, but back then, the, the home video camera was not a household item. There wasn't, they didn't even have the internet. And the, the internet came out in 1996. Know, we had a lot to talk about all this stuff. Keep going. Yeah, the, the internet didn't, you know, and, and even... After the internet came out, you, you wouldn't be able to watch video on the internet until way later in the 2000s. Um, so yeah, so the way that I would get noticed, like I would literally like plug together two VCRs, which stands for video cassette recorder. <laughs> like I would hit play on one and record on the other, like selectively, like, you know, to, that's how I edited it. And then I would duplicate the videos and literally walk to the post office and put, you know. Isn't it crazy it, that like 99% of the content creators now probably would never do that then to make content? Like, because well, it's so easy now. It's just pick up your phone, bang. Right, for sure. Like, for you sure. went through everything to figure out how to make content. Yeah, it was, it was there, there was very little noise to rise above because there were very few people creating any kind of content. And it's a, it's, it's a valid and interesting question. Like, if I was born 20 years later, yeah. would I have been able to achieve, like, the, the, the notoriety, like, the modicum of success that I did? And in one sense, it would be very, very difficult. There's so much noise to, to try to rise above. Yeah. But in another sense, I am such... A persistent bastard, well, such a a genuinely like rabid attention. Whore, I think I would have done it. I think you would have done it too. I mean, bro, the fact that you're the age that you are now, you're you're in your mid forties, right? I, I'm almost fifty. Yeah, dude. I'm, and you're I'm, uh, still doing it. I yeah, mean, you've you gone through everything. You know what yeah. I find so interesting? Like, you you obviously you dealt with drugs, right? Issues. Oh yeah, big yeah? time. Where did that fit into your success and like your timeline of? of like jackass and everything that you did? <clears throat> um, I had a serious issue with and alcohol before jackass. Yeah. And before jackass, I was a circus clown. Like, like I, an, an actual circus. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, dropped out of the University of Miami in 1993. I was homeless for three years. Then I moved in with my sister in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and she found out about Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Belly Clown College. And she was like, oh, this would be perfect for my brother. And I, and I thought the same thing. I thought if I could be a graduate of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Clown College, then people would take me more seriously because I'd be a trained circus professional and this would further my goal of becoming a stuntman. And, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of worked out that way. And, and uh, I went to clown college. I had a career as a clown working on cruise ships and, and in this, uh, this pretty haggard flea market circus. Um, and then uh, 
you know, and, and then Jackass starts like it, it uh, dude, it's just, just a wild, a wild so but thing. so did you start obviously leading okay. up to Jackass, right? The uh, the, the drugs started. I mean, I didn't really do cocaine on any kind of a regular basis until I moved in with my sister in Albuquerque. Like, there was just, like, more of that going on. The drugs, uh, I mean... And what specifically? I, I, I come from a long line of alcoholics. Like, everybody on my mom's side of the family is all, like, 100% of that family tree is, yeah. has alcoholism and addiction issues. Um I started like getting loaded, smoking pot every day, drinking all the time when I was 16. And that just, you know, that, that was from then on. Um, when Jackass started, I like, I was, you know, even when I was in the circus, I like was heavily abusing and always drunk. Um, Did you do it to perform? I don't think I, I mean, I would definitely do it to, to stay awake, you know, like I'd be yeah. awake for like a whole weekend of shows in the circus. And, yeah. and if I didn't keep doing then I'd just like fall yeah, asleep. Crash you know? out, yeah, for days. Um, but yeah, it wasn't necessarily like to work or, or, or on any level to try to be successful. I don't think it ever, I don't think drugs or alcohol ever furthered my uh productivity or my success on any level yeah and uh at the same time though uh it, it did work for me man like in the first for the first so many years it was like my persona like the wild crazy drunk you know yeah. like whatever like he'll do anything and, and i leaned into it but then it uh it distinctly stopped working for me and got when to was that um <clears throat> I was really out of control by like 2003. I mean, I, I was really, really out of control, but it, it hadn't like turned on me really badly. I would say it really turned on me badly in 2007. And I got sober in 2008. What, what were you doing at the time in 2000? Were you working, still working on Jackass? Um, the, there were four years in between the each of the first three jackass movies and we had a jackass the second jackass movie came out in 2006 so i wasn't really doing a whole lot um in 2007 um i was trying to become a rapper it was pretty bad <laughs> and uh what? and i was like doing a lot of drugs 2008 when you say like, a lot of just mean like a lot of cocaine like a lot of cocaine and I would go through, like, the steady, it was a steady, like a, a permanent thing. And um, I would go through, like, phases of, like, heavy-duty inhaling night. Bro, okay. Heavy, <laughs> okay. Like. That's insane. Because I did this, I remember doing this once when I was, like, I must have been 15. <clears throat> you talking about, like, you know, like, the dust-off yeah, things? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, not, I never did the dust-off thing. Okay. I never did the dust-off thing. I'm talking about... Uh, whip it, yeah. which is like they make, like they have the shit at Starbucks, you know, like they yeah. put the little cartridge in and they make whipped cream. Yeah. Yeah. Like I would inhale those cartridges. Like, Can't that shit just like kill you though? I, I'm sure it can. I'm sure there are some people who. They do it just done. I'm sure some people have died. Yeah. yeah. Like it's definitely not good for you. It's the, the, weird. I remember I I did that once and was like, this was, it, it was like a. Everything felt like whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, I would do it with the the express purpose of losing consciousness, where I'm like flopping around like unconscious, and then I would wake up and like whoa. Did you do it to like to to like you're doing because like a group of people and they want to see you do it, or you were just like I just wanted to have that experience. You just by yourself. I'm gonna crash. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. See that's that one's. <laughs> I had some, there's there's video footage of me too, like doing that. It just crashing like, out too. Yeah, just you know, bro. Like, that's insane. What 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 else? What other? Uh, I would go through phases of heavy uh, can. Um. Yeah. And and like uh, if I could get it, you've taken. Yeah, I I smoked a lot of pee, particularly when I was in New York. Isn't that like they, they say that like you could take that and it could just like change you forever, like one time. Um. 
Obviously, I've never tried it. I just, that's what I, I wouldn't heard. rule that out as a possibility, but I don't know that. Like, what do you actually experience on that? Um, people and cat are uh, a class of drugs known as dissociative. And um, dissociative, I would describe it as uh, not like not an upper or a downer per se, but it, it, uh, it just throws like a like a warp filter on your on your Reality. senses. Like yeah. I remember, like one time, like like uh, on like just I was in a bathtub and like I'm only in a, in a bathtub, but like to look at my feet, they were like thirty feet away. You know, like what there's the like there's just like depth perception was yeah. off and like um you know, it's a mixed bag too like you'll have different experiences at different times all right boys quick and rush to the podcast check this out holiday season guys if you're looking for a gift for yourself you need to treat yourself right keep yourself clean up the beard shaving whatever you got to do up here maybe shave the head as well they got clippers for everything beard head lower body everywhere i'm telling you i use it for everything obviously not the same clippers i have two sets of shoes but guys they make great gifts for your dad for your brother for your cousin for your uncle i feel like girls can even buy these products too sometimes they need to shave some arm hair that's none of my business but check this out go to manscape.com right now i promise you guys you will not be disappointed i've honestly been using manscape for the last like two years and they're actually super nice like the, the shavers themselves like I've legit used the same two for the last year and a half, and it's been solid. So go to manscaped.com, put in code RAWTALK to get 20% off everything, literally right now for the holiday season. They got a ton of bundles. Do not miss it. Manscaped.com, code RAWTALK, 20% off everything, plus free shipping. So you get all that plus free shipping. Let's get back into this podcast. Like one time one time I was in a, a, a hotel room, and like I... Like my experience was the the whole hotel room just start free falling, and I'm looked up and it's like I could see like a shaft that it was falling through, so, like an elevator almost. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But what, so you were none of those things scared you. you I just loved like, it. I loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. I would just like I would just be piling more and more drugs into my body to try to keep more stuff like that happening. And you were never afraid of just like dying. No, no. Um, I, I, I it, like when I was really in it, like there were times where I thought like, man, I'm genuinely killing myself. Like there was one time I, I the, you know, I've, I've described that I was, uh, he, like hearing voices it, like it, it, to stay awake for so many hours would, would bring about what's known as psychosis right. where you're, you're hallucinating, you know, seeing without things. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe, perhaps. Yeah, I always yeah. had to be the cause of it, but I would um, be hearing voices, you know, like in my ears, like as if I had like an earpiece, I'd be hearing like voices talking to me. I I would uh, have hallucinations, which you know any number of things would happen, but like there would be people walking around that I would see, and they were just never actually there. Um, I had like these experiences with with hallucinate like tactile hallucinations where you actually feel things like there was a uh, this big chair that that I sat in and like it just erupted into flames and I thought it was the coolest thing ever ever because like the flames weren't burning me I was just in this big chair and it's like wow cool it's on fire you know like and uh I, I again I would just keep wanting to do more and more drugs and at one point I had like all these pills and all this pain and all this night side and I was just looking at it like in front of me and I was in that same chair and I, and I remember like having the distinct thought like 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 I'm straight up killing myself with all this and yeah. I remember thinking like you know like fucking who cares and just in, in that one moment of thinking I don't care if I die like the chair just with me in it. Like I had just had the experience that it was like, like a, a big guy like you, like spun the chair, you know, like it, it was a, it was a tactile hallucination. And I know that if there was like a video camera set up that like nothing would have happened, you were just but I had, yeah. I had the experience, you know, I had the experience and it was like a really, really powerful message. Like that, like in response to me thinking, I don't care if I die. It was just like, like, like some your, spiritual like your, entity yeah. thought like, think again. Like it was in response to that thought. Like and, where your subconscious was like, no, bro. Yeah. 
and and uh, that that happened in 2007, and the following year in 2008, when I went to rehab, they put a lot of emphasis on like uh, having a higher power. You know, like it, it's the, there's just a spiritual component to recovery, and it was very impressed upon me. Very very important to have a higher power, and and you know I've hated religion as long as I've been alive. I just think it's awful, and I can't stand it. Um, but I, I remember making a very deliberate decision in rehab that my higher power, whatever I, what I'm going to pray to, yeah. is whatever made that chair spin with me in it. Because like it was a response to the thought, like I don't care if I die, and like whatever spiritual entity made me have the experience of that chair spinning, like is an entity that cares about me, that's not me, and it's like whatever. It is. Do you man. have a, do you have a do you have a relationship with God? Do you pray? Do you... I meditate every day. Yeah. I maintain a, an average of of more than forty minutes meditating every single day for um, coming up on four years. Yeah, damn. I take so, it super seriously too. So spirituality is more so like you lean towards that. Sure, I mean yeah. like uh, you would you don't identify it as like God or some sort of. I religion. mean, I just call it the universe. Yeah. You know, I think the word God is super polarizing because it's trying to like attach some kind of human traits to uh, all that is. Yeah. And if you ju- if you just say the universe, like the universe is not a polarizing concept and it's yeah. like very synonymous with yeah. whatever people are referring to as god yeah i get it dude that's that's i mean that's beautiful though that like something it's like almost as if you know you weren't supposed to keep going down that road i mean dude i had a bunch of like little spiritual interventions where they were like, like yo what are you like what the f- are you doing moments i, I, I had uh yeah i had um this this wall of of shoes that they, it was like there were horizontal shelves and vertical shelves so there was all these cubby holes and I had a shoe sponsor and in each little cubby was a pair of shoes like on display yeah and um, I I remember like at one point like just again I was just in such a dark place in 2007 and um, like the 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 powerful message was like all right like stop it. You know, stop with all the and 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 stop it. And and all of the shoes, the whole wall of shoes just started like you know like tapping their toes, like you know like impatiently tapping their toes, like okay, like we're waiting, like you know stop already. You got to be done with this. Yeah, you got to be done with it. And um, there was a there was a uh, a notebook that I did my work with in rehab, and uh, and I wrote on it like that chair spun, those shoes tapped. Period. And I, th- that was like. And that was my thing. I wrote on the notebook, man. Did you have people around you at the time that were like encouraging or, or not encouraging? I, I, like I, I surrounded myself with yes people that would allow for me to keep. Uh... And it's sad because like there was nothing um, about those people that like they, they weren't bad people. They were, yeah. you know, yeah. like they were just people who uh, I was able to, you know, uh, have a power dynamic over you know over yeah, it's like, you I, like steve-o and this like if, guy. You, if you were going to have a relationship with me at that time it that relationship was a hundred percent on my terms and if you were going to push back or tell me like anything i didn't want to hear you were gone so yeah. the only people that could be around me were yes people and they were all wonderful people but uh you know they were like arguably as sick as i was yeah so so when that started to change for you, um, did you notice that like a- other aspects or other dynamics of your life got better? Like obviously taking drugs and not taking drugs oh, is better. For sure. I mean, if you're asking like, did, did I notice my life change when I got clean and sober? Like, yeah, obviously. 100%. Yeah. And, and I think that like that there's um, like it's, a spiritual law that like the way we treat others is a reflection of how we feel about ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah. And at, over the course of, of uh, you know, just the deterioration of, of me, like with drugs and alcohol, like I think that I can just, it's almost like a timeline of just my self-esteem just deteriorating because my actions were just so 
shameful and like I was just so pathetic, man, you know? And like I my self-esteem, my self-worth just got lower and lower and lower and I developed an ability to be like genuinely nasty. You know, like yeah. the way that I treated others was was very affected and um like I, I would try to hurt people's reputation. I would try to do damage to people's reputations, like hurt their feelings. Like I was just nasty and venomous at times. And um, that's something that uh, took a long time to heal from. Yeah. Cause you were doing it essentially to yourself, like you said. Right, for sure. And and like in recovery that, you know, like in, in recovery rehab, you know, they talk about building self-esteem through esteemable acts. You know, like yeah. we, uh, we, we just, how we, we help how we feel about ourselves by behaving in a way that, that we can feel good about, you know, like, yeah. and, and, and we can improve the way we feel about ourselves by deliberately changing the way we treat others. It, it works both ways. Yeah. So if you go out of your way to be cool to people and do the right thing, then like the natural effect is that you're going to feel better about yourself. Is this something that you've, you've always believed in or was it just like rehab made you realize that? I think that it, I would have always believed it. And, um, you know, when I was in my descent into, you know, really, really dark addiction, my whole deal was that I would have said, nobody's perfect. We all know that there's no such thing as perfect. So if you're going to be happy, you need to embrace your imperfections. And that was just my story. Like, yeah, I'm not perfect. Nobody is. But just, so I'm just like, okay yeah. with being a- like you validated a, it. Yeah, I'm just okay with being a, a pathetic addict who's, who's uh, capable yeah. of being really nasty. Yeah. That was just like, I called it my imperfections, which I'm okay with. So everyone leave me alone. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. So, so in regards to like the stuff and Jack Ash, did that ever affect your relationship with other guys or other cast members? Sure. Or <laughs> sure. There was, um, you, you know, the movie Boogie Nights. Yeah. Where yeah. like at the end of the movie, Marky Mark is like super tweaked out on meth, and like Burt Reynolds, you know, like won't film him. He's like, you're, you are in this condition, you know, in this state, I yeah. will not have you on camera in this state. And, and Mark Wahlberg's like, no, no, come on. Like, I, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. It's like, yeah. you know, like, and like, you, like that kind of same exact thing Sweet. was like what happened on Jackass, you know, like yeah. there was a point, um, when, uh, on, on the second movie, like, um, that one of the scenes in the second movie, um, Bam was uh, being branded. You know, it was like a, a, a dick shaped brand. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, he kept moving and then they kept rebranding. So it was like a bunch of brands, like all a mess of it. And that was like the, the, the funny bit. But I swear, I'm pretty damn sure that that was supposed to be me getting branded. But, like, uh, you know, I think of the. I would maybe I was late for call time or something like they sent somebody into my room and I was just laying there with blue lips like it was all like fished out on oxide like huffing night and they're like yeah dude like yeah that's not it dude like yeah. you're you're not on camera today yeah we're not filming you in this state so bam got the bit yeah did did because I know he he dealt with some like drug abuse and, and alcohol abuse as well right oh bam yeah yeah for sure. Yeah, for sure. Like famously. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and, and it's going from what I understand, Bam's in really uh, the best place that he's been in, in a long, long time. Like, you know, uh, I think that he's uh, credibly clean and sober for 90 days now. Yeah. And um, personally, I attribute that to um, a criminal case that, that he's got going on. Like, uh, like he assaulted his brother, like he made terroristic threats to his family and, and, and he was arrested for that. And I think that the, the court system, the judge is, um, really taking the case like pretty seriously, not based on the severity of the crimes, it's misdemeanor stuff, but the court is recognizing like how, needs help for real. how seriously he needs help. And yeah. so th I think the court is ready to impose very real consequences if Bam 
fails a drug test or uh, yeah. you know, like it runs into trouble with alcohol. And I think Bam is super, super scared of like being in a jail cell. Yeah. And I think that that is like that the fear of being locked up is inspiring him to like actually like be really clean and sober. And that's a great way to get a start. Yeah. You know, that's a, whatever makes us like start out the the journey of recovery doesn't matter what it is but as of yet we've not seen any accountability like you know like, like everything when when bam's talking about stuff it's like oh it's everybody else's fault but his yeah. and i think that really like what 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 brings about change is accountability yeah. you know like you you really can't expect sobriety to to last or be meaningful if uh every if all your problems are somebody else's fault a hundred percent so to someone who who might be dealing with that or someone who may deal with that what sort of advice would you give someone to like start that process of really accepting that like yo this is a me problem because most people yeah. go like yeah it's everyone else's fault yeah and, and i'm not even suggesting that like that it, it's about um you know, like admitting you're wrong. I mean, it is, it is. It's about admitting you're wrong. It's about accepting responsibility for your mistakes. But more than that, it, it's like, we can't control like other people, places and things. And as long as we, uh, you know, see ourselves as being at the mercy of other people, places and things, then we're gonna have a mental like a victim mentality. Yeah. And if you've got a victim mentality, then it's like, congrats, you're a victim. You know, yeah. like and you're that's, living in everyone else's like whatever yeah. confinement they put you in. It's like congratulations, you're a victim and you've got a valid excuse for why your life sucks. Yeah. You know, but that's like what's gonna happen if you put your destiny and the control of things that are you know, people and places beyond your control. Yeah. Like, yeah, you know, like the only thing we can control is our own actions, our own thoughts, our own behaviors, and um, that's what that's where it's at. Yeah, you why, take control of your own shit. Why do you think it's so hard for people to do that? Because I, I there's so many times when like I I even look back and I'm like, oh, I knew this was me, and I let it drag on because right. I didn't want to accept it. Like I needed to fucking change it, dude. That's the million dollar question, man. Because um, most people are just so unwilling even unable to admit that they're wrong and it's counterintuitive because when somebody admits they're wrong that like automatically like earns respect yeah if somebody steps up and says yo i'm wrong i want to acknowledge that i'm wrong and i want to like do what i can to make it right that person has just won the respect of whoever this thing that they're saying that to yeah, and uh, it, it's it, it commands respect. It's endearing. It's productive, and it uh, you know it, it it paves the way forward for becoming a better version of yourself. Yeah, and most people are just not willing to do that. I wouldn't have ever been been willing to do that if uh, if I wasn't conditioned to by like this this whole you know twelve step recovery. Yeah. you know, community that I live in. So as far as like, what, what would I recommend? It's just really super simple that, um, that alcoholism addiction is, uh, it, it, it is a disease. It's centered in our mind and it's characterized by an inability to choose when or how much you're going to drink or take drugs. You just literally do not have the power to choose. You do not have the ability to stop. And nothing that you do on your own will ever give you that power. You, you have no power. That's step one of the 12 steps is we admitted we were powerless over alcohol or drugs or sex or whatever. Yeah. And so in admitting that, you're recognizing that you can't beat the problem by yourself you can only do it with help in a community, a community yeah. yeah and so the advice is find that community even if it's just one person 
find that one person and say, hey, I, I admit that I'm powerless. You know, I, I got my ass beat and now I'm ready to accept help. Yeah. Just don't try to do it on your own. Yeah. So, and dude, that's, that's, that's amazing what you've done, honestly. Well, thanks, man. I'm super, super grateful for it. Like, yeah. uh, it, I, I owe everything to it. Like a hundred percent, man. Um, Do you think if you kept going down that road, you you wouldn't be here today? If if I was still alive after going down that road uh, to this point today, God, I'd be better off dead. I think you know. Yeah. If I wasn't dead, I'd probably I think everybody would wish that I was. Oh, you know, man. it's sad to say. Yeah. You know, but like I think there are certain people who when when you learn that they did die, you think, mm, you know, like finally that person is at peace. Damn. You know, like, yeah. and, and I don't, I don't like, you know, I, I know that, that when, um, when, when we all learned that Aaron Carter had yeah. passed away, yeah. like I remember thinking, you know, he's in a, I think he's genuinely in a better place. I think a now. lot of people, I saw a lot of people yeah. saying that. I think he's genuinely in a better place now. I think that he's finally at peace. That's a good thing. And it's just like unbelievably tragic and sad that he left behind like a one year old baby. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's always like, yeah. So, so that's how it is, man. I don't know. I, 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 I would like to think that if I didn't get clean and sober, that I would have been dead by now because I think that um, peace would be much better than any possible life that I could have had. Yeah. Dude, it's heavy, but it's, but it's, it's a blessing that you just sit and talk about it. Cause you yeah, can help it. so many people with this kind of stuff, man. I was something I really wanted to talk about today. Hey man, I, um, I, I never shy away from it. You know, like I don't ever seek to, to do interviews just to talk about recovery, you know, like yeah, there, but there are, um, like all kinds of podcasts. There's all kinds of like, you know, whatever media outlets that are right. like solely focused on yeah. recovery. And, and I, I always like turn it, turn it down. The reason why I like talking about it beyond just the idea and the aspect of recovery and how important that is, is that everything in our lives like fall down to that same concept of it's, it's up to us, right? Like sure. the idea of things that happen to me is everyone else's fault, but my own, right? Like I've dealt with that. And I know I can, I know tons of people who I've ex have conversations with and, you always see the minute that they realize like, yeah, like I could be the best person, do all these things right. And like, he thinks could happen to me. And I can find myself in a situation where like, you know, I think the best situation is going to happen, but like, there's still like my, not everything's my fault, but there's still faults that like, I will look back and I'll be like, ah, oh, well, I could have given this a little bit more time, right. but I was overly optimistic. Not that everything's my fault that that person struck sure. me or this one, but everything does start here. It's all, it's all like, of self right the so way, the same concepts right yeah and and it, it's so it's so rad to to hear like somebody who's not kind of in you know my world describe it because you're describing precisely what it is and the way that we say it is that you know it's not that everything's our fault it's that we have a part in everything yeah our choices yeah and like and, and you know the, in the 12 steps, the fourth step says, uh, you know, we made a fearless moral inventory of ourselves, a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves, which I, I don't necessarily agree with the wording of that because the word fearless suggests that it's something to be afraid of. And yeah. the word moral suggests that it's something about being like a good or bad person. Right. And it's neither of those things. The inventory is, is about uh, listing examples uh, of things in your life which make you uncomfortable and and drive you to, to soothe yourself with whatever substance or behavior it is yeah you know like what uh, it, it, like what the reason why the alcoholic drinks is because there's just this unbelievable discomfort in their own skin and they just can't stand it and they have to, soothe it by, by drinking or yeah. taking drinks, you know? And so the idea of the 12 steps and of the inventory is to get to the root of that discomfort. And so in the inventory process, we start off by making a list of resentments, 
You know, like we just feel so so burned up with resentment. We're so angry. Like, you know, it's everybody. This person did that. And then that, that yeah, that the discomfort of the resentment. We have to soothe that with drinking. And then in so we make the list of resentments with 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 four columns. The first column, uh, I feel resentful towards, and then it's a person, place, or a thing. Yeah. And then the second column, the cause. And in that second column, this is where you can write your victim story about how you got screwed over by the, and then the third column, the, uh, like what, the, what is affected? Like what's, the, what's the, the button that's being pushed that's really affecting you? Like, and that, that can be, uh, they're, they're messing with my money. You know, yeah. like, like uh, my, my financial security is at stake here. My ex relations is at stake. My, uh, you know, my, um, Per, my personal relations, my, my pride is at stake, my self-esteem. It's like for the, whatever button is being pushed, which is important to know. And then the fourth column is the only one that really matters is what is my part in this? Yeah. Like what, what, like what, what can I change about myself that would, you know, and in that fourth column, you, you, uh, identify how you could just handle it differently so that yeah. no matter how much the world has wronged you yeah. that you're not gonna have to like be like so affected by it yeah you know? well and that's it, the thing that's just so interesting is like because uh, I've, I've never dealt with like severe addiction in this sense right but all those concepts in that last column like yeah. the self like okay this is this was my place and how i got to this point in this situation or whatever it's relevant not just to like alcoholism sure. or addiction. It's relevant just to like self improvement, and like 100%. that's what everyone should be thinking about in all these circumstances, whether it be like a love relationship or a business relationship. For sure, you have to find your point where it's like, okay, I, I know that like, yeah, I came here with the best intentions, and you know, for a lot of people, it's like heartbreak or it's a business fuck up or someone right. fucks you over, right? I've been there many times, and I could always, I'm on, I don't really do all these these other ones, but I'm on the last one where I'm like, okay, well. I did allow this because I wasn't checking that. You know, I wasn't as aware of this thing that I could have been aware of that I'm now aware of that it f***ed me over in this way, but now I'm able to look at it differently and be better moving forward. And this is just every, literally everything and every success in life is in related to the same exact concept, which is why I think it's so dope. And I've never even heard these steps before. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, dude, it, it, it's, it's epic, man. And what's great about the, the inventory and that fourth column where you identify your part and how you could have handled it you know differently so that you wouldn't like have to get loaded over it um no matter what it is let's say like you know i'm resentful of like the you know say hypothetically like i was i was molested you know i'm resentful towards the person that that molested me when i was a kid right. like what's the cause here well you've got like a, a defenseless innocent kid that was like terribly violated yeah. you know like the kid didn't do anything wrong and then it's like, so what do you put in the fourth column there? You know, and, and the answer is like, I'm, I'm still hanging on to it. You know, like, uh, I'm, I'm like, a, I got like, I'm, I'm the, I, I, what I'm, I'm failing to have forgiveness, yeah. you know, like the, like the, you didn't, I need to cultivate forgiveness. That's my part. Like I'm hanging on to this, you know, yeah. and I'm like letting, I, I'm not, I'm, my part is I'm not letting go of it. And then like you can go even further and deeper where it's like anybody who's going to commit that kind of an atrocious crime against a child is by definition not a healthy and happy person. No. You know, like there's a saying, hurt people hurt people. Yeah. So as difficult as it is in that fourth column, you've got to say, hey, I'm resentful towards this person like because I, I lack compassion. Like whatever their deep rooted sickness is that drives them to be even capable of harming another like this, that this is a sick person who needs compassion. And it's tough, man. Yeah. It's really, really difficult to pray for people, to yeah. have compassion for people, to forgive people who have done such atrocious things, especially when they've done them to you. But we're not doing it for that person. For yourself. We're doing it for ourselves. Yeah. And 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 uh, that's where the power is. You know, that's where, where the power of it is. And I, I like re I really, really heavily subscribe to uh, you know, the spiritual 
concept of oneness, you know, and, and we're all interconnected. Like the, the, the separation between you and I is just an illusion. You know, yeah. it's just an illusion and it's for the distinct purpose that the universe can experience itself. Because if the universe is just one thing, and then it, it can't have any, any experience. Yeah. So the universe divides itself into me and you and everything else so that these different parts can relate to each other. And in that relativity comes experience. Yeah. And then if you've ever heard people have, um, people give their account of a, a near death experience where they, they're, they're dead, whether like they're like actually physically like dead or not, like the, these experiences are all so, so similar. So like they're, they're the same thing. The people are coming back and they're describing like have what's called life review. You know this yeah. thing like your life flashes before your eyes. Right. Like I trip out on on near death experience videos on YouTube. Like it the, when when people are describing the life review, like there's no uh, time component to it. Like the amount of detail that these people are describing is like unbelievable and in going through the life review you not only relive all of the worst shit that you did to others but you relive it as that as the others have you heard about that no but that would make sense like you like you this whole the, this whole illusion of separation is gone and then you go through your whole life and you actually experience from the perspective of the person who you harmed, you have their experience from when you harmed them and without the component of time. So it's like, like an eternity and like, and the detail is like insane. Like it scares the crap out of me <laughs> for how much like I'm going to have to, you know, to reap what you sow. Yeah, dude, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And, and when you think about this life review and, and if anybody's listening, watching this, like, you know, I'm here to promote a, a crazy multimedia comedy special, but it's not more important than yeah. checking out life review because like when you think about the person who screwed you over, like, man, you know, they, they tell you that the, the way to heal is to forgive the person, to pray for the person, not only to pray for the person, but to pray for that person to get everything in their life that you want for yourself, which is a tall ass order. <laughs> well, yeah. It's a tall ass order. Yeah. But if you think about the life review process, it makes, it makes it a lot all just easier. reflections like of ourselves, it's like the way we treat people, yeah. the, like even the people that we bring into our lives is because like th that was like, that's us in a way in different versions. Yeah. Like what we allow to happen to ourselves is so much shit, man. Damn it. So, so you even, you even avoid the ones that are like, can, could be beneficial. All drugs. I mean, people describe ayahuasca and the experience of it as like, going through hell and like you know in 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 like this like in the trip like you're you're in like this gnarly hell and you resolve all of these issues and you come out of the trip like having resolved like the your your things and it's like all right, you know, like I really don't need. I've been through plenty of hell. <laughs> I, got I got it. I've been, I've been through plenty of hell. And um, what do they say too about religion? Um, uh, they say religion is for people who are afraid of going to hell. Spirituality is for people who have been to hell. <laughs> like, Interesting. Yeah, and they're over it. Because <laughs> I had a, I had a, I've done it a few times now, and like my experience with it was like. I guess the best way I could summarize it, I had this moment where like life and death felt not the same, but it everything felt kind of like okay. Like it was it it didn't feel like they were separate. Okay. And the best way I could describe that for, maybe for me because I was I had struggled so much and like even to this day I'm still very pretty fearful of death, but way way less than I ever was growing up. Right. Um it just created a sense of calmness for me in relationship to that. And I think overall, I think not having that, like that idea in the back of your shoulder, your mind, your head thinking like, oh, you know, obviously someday I'm going to die. We all are. And I just lost that fear. And I think it, I'm not saying someone needs to go do this to experience this. Cause obviously the work, even outside of like taking this medicine or this, this 
like is needs to be done in in our real life but i did get this sense of like it's it's okay even though forever you know i'd have these conversations and you talk to people and they'd be like yeah it's going to be okay and you know it, it's an inevitable and you're it's going to be it's fine but i i really had this moment where like i really felt it not just heard it not just right. thought it not was just told it i had this weird feeling of like no this is like it's it's all it's all good 100%. So and I'm not, then, obviously, like, yeah. I'm not, I'm not trying to convince you to do this because you're oh, yeah, past I, it. I, 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 like, uh, it, it's fine. It, 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 I'm, I'm not even, uh, I'm not offended. I'm not, yeah, yeah. I'm not concerned. Um, it, it's another benefit of, of watching these near death experiences too, because, uh, like it, it, so the, the accounts are so similar. Like you can't have all these different people describing like the, you know, such similar stuff and not lend credibility to what they're saying. Yeah. And like the, the common thread is that, that, that this physical like reality that we're in now is the tough part. Like yeah. that, like the, the unit, like the consensus among everybody is that they're that they feel that they've gone home, that they're embraced by pure love in in something that's more beautiful and spectacular than anything we could ever experience on Earth as humans, and that when like when they're in there, um, you know, like on the other side, like it's they they they're, they're told that they have to come back and that's why they're back. They're they're told that now you have to go back into your body and like across the board, everybody's like, yo that i don't want to go back, you know i don't want to go back into that you know and uh and they're like they're, they're like made to go back in some very rare instances like they they uh they they feel they know that that uh, a child or a loved one or someone like really needs them to come back and yeah. they'll do it willingly but like you know universally they're they all think it is way this fact way better on the other side. And you're talking about all these different accounts like that you've like people have, you know, spoken about and like filming YouTube videos and like everyone's saying the same. Yeah. Stuff. I mean, there, there's like, um, what are they like, uh, the near death society or something. There's a whole, like, there's literally a society of people I check it who, out. who I never... meet. Yeah. It's, uh, it's pretty epic too. I, I, I'll, I'll text you a particularly good one. Yeah. yeah send like, me I'll, one. I'll send you a particularly good one. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's so comforting. You know, they talk about being like reunited with, uh, you know, everybody that you loved and lost, you yeah. know, like they, um, like when people come back from these near death experiences, they, uh, you know, they don't fear death at all. They're like, they're all of their, uh, materialism. They just don't give a crap about it anymore. They literally just want to, to just be loving and love others and and yeah. like you know they're just so much like happier and um i just i could it, I, I benefit so much from from consuming that content and uh it really puts you know it, it quells a lot of anxiety about like dying about living about like yeah all right, guys, quick and rush for the podcast, Factor Meals. Check this out. Obviously, I've talked about meal prep in the past and how important it is. Clearly, if you want to get bigger, get leaner, get stronger, if you're not eating your meals, you're missing big time. I mean, people always say, oh, how important is diet and compare 80, 20% this, 10% that as far as diet, as far as working out. You cannot outwork a bad diet, okay? Like, it doesn't matter what your goal is, whether it's burning body fat, whether it's building muscle, if your diet's not on point, you're going to be failing over and over again. Yeah, you might get a little strong, Longer, you might get a little sturdier, but you're not going to be getting closer to whatever that goal is specifically for weight, right? So if it's losing weight or building weight, you need the calories, the right amount of calories in order to get to that goal. So Factor Meals got you guys. Super clean, super easy, super good. Very macro friendly, everything you guys need. And honestly, they taste great. Okay, so if you guys want to check it out, go to factormeals.com slash raw talk 50 to get 50% off right now. Again, that's factormeals.com slash raw talk 50 to get 50% off right now. This is something you don't want to miss out on. I promise you, like if you, if you're like a person and you're constantly like buying food out, I swear you're going to be spending way more money doing that than you are just like getting your meals delivered. At the same time, it's going to help keep you regimented and strict to get actually to your goals instead of like wasting your time in and outside of the gym. So let's get back into this podcast. What I find so, so like, interesting is how complicated we we like make our our lives and ourselves being 
like divisive within ourselves and like with other people. Like it seems like like one of the biggest parts of the human experience is like being better than other people or trying to be better. And people like people are like we're all taught like specifically now in this day and age is like it's like it's this constant race to like money or sure. or like some sort of status or notoriety. And it's it's crazy how it all comes down to the same thing where it's like not that it doesn't matter because like you know obviously someone with more notoriety or popularity can like spread a a good message and also can spread a terrible message but i just find it interesting how you know you talk about the idea of the oneness and the, the unity of all of us but like how humans in general it's when we're here in this space it's all about being better than someone right. else for sure competition man and and uh that that's kind of by design too because we got to eat we got we want to live yeah. you know food and shelter and all that so like that's sort of the purpose of the ego is is for survival but like the, the the also the ego can never be satisfied no matter how much money you yeah. get like if anything the more money you earn like money does not uh there, there's no satisfaction in in earning money you not only do you not get satisfaction after from, a point right a basic needs. right right yeah. exactly yeah. not only do you not get satisfaction from earning money but the more money you earn it creates a vacuum where you need more and more and yeah. like dude i was just talking to my brother about it. my brother lives in his van you, you walk past the van oh, wow, cool, he's man. lived in a van for the last like eight ten years basically dude, that's epic like fully but but yeah it's Go a ahead. sickness dude it's a sickness and like i look at um you know how my views on on money and and success ha have changed as i've become more successful and saved more money like i find myself way more uh afraid of financial insecurity the more money that i have yeah because you feel like you have like, to keep it going yeah, yeah. It, it's it's insane and like um before i got clean and sober you know like i described i'm doing and I think, oh, I don't care if I die. Like, I expected that I would die super young. I, I, I thought that was even kind of cool. I was like, oh, gee, I'm like flame out like a rock star. I'm going to be dead like super young. Like, no part of me believed that I was going to make it to 40 years old. And so, like, I, I didn't care about, like, what I was saving or anything. Yeah. And then I get sober in 2008. And like, there was just this perfect storm of number one, like I had burned all the bridges in my career. There was no jackass going on. Yeah. And so like, I didn't have any like, like money coming in. I also, um, like that everyone's talking about, you got to have a higher power. You got to deflate the ego. You got to like live spiritually. And I'm like, how does that jive with being Steve-O, the attention? from jackass you know like yeah. how do you go and be like look at me look at me i'm gonna shove something in my butt and have no ego about it you know like i <laughs> yeah. didn't even know if i could continue to pursue a career in entertainment like and and be in recovery and then on top of that now all of a sudden i stopped like actively killing myself i started like taking care of myself and then i was confronted with the very real possibility that i was only halfway through, maybe not even halfway through my life. So yeah. now I'm like, holy crap, maybe I'm gonna be alive for many more decades and maybe my earnings potential has just like evaporated. Yeah. Like, and maybe I have, I don't know how I'm gonna eat, like eat. I don't know how I'm gonna support myself and I might be alive for many, many more decades. And then remember it was 2008. So the financial crisis comes and just wipes out what little I had saved. Yeah. And I'm like, all of a sudden I became literally terror, terrorized by like financial insecurity. And, and, and I was like, yo, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hustle and hustle so that, so that I can support myself you yeah. know i got this whole life in front of me now i don't know how i'm going to support myself and then like i very very deliberately became more uh, aggressive about trying to earn and be successful yeah. and and be savvy and smart and then in that that just began a journey of sickness honestly like a different kind of sickness a yeah. different kind of sickness it began yeah. it, be, it, be, it began a different kind of sickness and like 
you know, I, I know what human nature is. I don't want to be like, you know, a greedy guy. I don't want to be like, you know, but at the same time, like, I am subject to the laws of, of, of human nature. And I hate it because like, as I become like more successful and I'm now I'm at a point where I've got all kinds of people whose livelihood is on my shoulders. You know, yeah. I've got like payroll for all kinds of people, you yeah. know, warehouses and staff and like, yeah. like people who rely on me for their livelihood. I understand. For and sure. like my whole mentality about that has been like, yeah, like hook everybody up super generous and like through like this last Jackass movie, man, all my, it just went through the roof, like my touring. Yeah. Like, uh, I mean, I'm, I bought my own tour bus. I'm going to huge, doing shows in big ass theaters and yeah. making all kinds of money all over the place. And then since the interest rates went up, like we've seen like people's expendable income really dry up, you know? Yeah. And so then, yeah. so now like money is, is, uh, like tougher to come by, like not as much revenue coming in, um, you know, tougher to sell tickets on tour, like, you know, tougher to sell merch online. And uh, it, the, the, the mother f for me is that, like I said, dude, I was selling so much merch, I got my own warehouse. And then it was going so well, I added a second warehouse. Yeah. I've got like, I've got insane overhead, like fixed costs yeah, that it. are like ridiculous. And like, and so I got so much money going out and it's great when like you're killing it, Yeah. but like it's been, it's been kind of a downturn, you know? And yeah. so now like I've got too much overhead, too much fixed costs to, to have like my revenue dip down. So now like I'm in a position of straight hemorrhaging money and, it, and, and like, I'm in a, you know, like. What are you uh, doing to plug the hole? Well, that's the thing I got to like, you know, like on Monday, I'm, I've got like a, a call with the accountants. The problem is that like everything where I've, like, if I do anything with anybody, it's like, oh yeah, you get this percent, you know, <laughs> like just like you get this, you know, like yeah. I've been stupid generous. And now like just looking at the overall picture of all my businesses and, and all of everything, like I have to stop being a maniac with money. Yeah. And then that means that now I got to like, make the tough decisions of like, okay, dude, like we're, we're cutting off this too bad for that person. Yeah. You know, or you gotta consolidate we're, we're, we're shutting down the, the, the warehouse. That's, you know, like we're doing this, we're doing that. And, um, and I'm like, ah, it's, it's like, it's, it's all, it all feels like an exercise in me becoming like what I hate, you know, like yeah. I want to be like the man and hook everybody up. And I'm at a point where I, I gotta, I gotta like cut it off because I don't want to be the dumb ass who earned millions and millions of dollars and lost it all and is now struggling. Yeah, <laughs> you know? no, I get it. Yeah, I get it for so sure. it's tough, man. It's Let tough. Me... Like balancing. No, you're great. Balancing doing uh, like the right spiritual thing, being a right guy and like not being a stupid asshole with money is tough. I get it. It's so tough, man. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. It's just, but that's like, that's the money thing. Like that's the whole, that's, that's the whole like cash 22 on it. Right. Like you, you need it and then it's never enough but then it's like yo i don't want to it right. can't just be about money but then right. like you have to cover these bottom lines i get it man like i've i've totally i totally understand it dude check out this this saying that that fucked me up dude because it like it makes so much sense um a man who has nothing only has to worry about his next meal but a man who has everything has to worry about his last meal yeah, oh, <laughs> is, that, oh, is that messed up? Like, because I mean, when I think back to like dropping out of the University of Miami, like homeless for three years, like, yeah. you know, like I had literally nothing. Yeah. And like, I expected that I would die young having failed at life, you know, but I also really thought that I was filming some dope ass shit and that like it would you know, like the, the videos I was making would somehow like play after I was dead and gone. And like, I look back on those times. I mean, dude, I had everything to be terrified of and, and just depressed and bummed. And like, I don't remember it being that. I remember being like, 
like there was just some some special like magic about each day and like i was so stoked on life and i had no good reason to be stoked on life all i was worried about was my next meal yeah and, and now and now you have everything to be stoked on but it's like you you start worrying <gasps> totally yeah. totally because it's like i've got everything to be stoked on my life is so epic and i'm like man like Bunny's going out the door. Like I got to How do I shut down all of the spending? And then like, what's going to be left? And like, how like how long really will will my savings last? It's it's sitting there like agonizing anxiety over like what your last meal is going to look like. Yeah. So it's like it's like finding some balance within that because like I think the special part like you get to the point of the money and having it from like that you have that clear those clear thoughts of like you have that crazy optimism that you were talking about yeah. without all like the expectations. You got to, you know, sign these checks, blah, 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 all this right, stuff. Right, right. So it's like, how do you get back to having that clear optimism? You know, with the, 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 the obvious answer is in relationships. And it's interesting too. Like, I mean, I'm sure that for a lot of people like watching this, listening to this, like it's just totally unrelatable. And I'm sure that there's no, probably but, but like, it, it, the, it is, but it isn't like it's right. whether, cause we're talking on a different scale, right? But everything's right. just like a different scale right. for them. And the right. same concepts will, will be had in their lives as well, sure, just on sure. different, different scales. And, and, and I'm, I'm really happy to, to like be past a point where I'm like really concerned about, you know, I'm just relating my own experience and, and what, what's true to me. And like, if, uh, if anybody thinks it's tone deaf or like, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't don't worry matter. About that. It doesn't we matter. Don't worry about that. I really, really don't care about that. But the, I, I make this point because it's in like, speaking up about it like I'm, clearly like i'm voicing to you like yeah. my fears you know yeah, i'm voicing my I'm, I'm voicing my my fears and, I, and i'm speaking up about like what upsets me and and in doing that just by 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 vocalizing it like you you take power like yeah, you live you get it you let a yeah, little bit of it go i'm let i'm let i'm taking power out of like the the fear that, that grips me and the grip is loosened, you know, like yeah. here I'm describing like being so like fear of this and fear of that. And like, honestly, by talking about it, like I feel way more comfortable than and, I did when I walked in. Yeah, and sat yeah, down. yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah. And the thing about it, too, is interesting is like we all, whether it's them listening on a smaller scale or me listening and being able to relate on a similar scale or yeah. whatever. It is an undeniable thing that you're just going to deal with. And it is just it, you just have to accept that it is just a part of life to figure right. out that way and. As you age, as you grow, like whether you're 18, you're 20, 30, 40, it doesn't matter. It's a constant journey to just figure out what fits the best and how, and it's just, that's life. Right. And then and, you can die, yeah, <laughs> which is yeah. such a crazy thing to me. I know, dude, for sure. I say this all the time that, that the human experience is like a really fucked up catch 22. Like, it's almost like a cruel prank on us that... <laughs> That we have one instinct, which is to survive, yeah. and one guarantee, which is we won't. Yo, it's <laughs> holy <laughs> shit. Yeah. Like oh, man, you're dropping bars right now. Dude, like I we're, love we're, that. We're not going to survive, and we're, we're absolutely, all of us, just barreling towards our inevitable demise, yeah. which insane. we fear the most. Like, we're just on a straight fucking collision course with the one thing we're most afraid of and the closer we get to it like even if we're lucky yeah we just deteriorate and wilt <laughs> <laughs> Bro, it's so real i know it's and so like the 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 whole purpose of the human experience as i see it is to come to terms with mortality you yeah, know absolutely. and that's why people turn to religion i think that's why religion it, was created because people are fucking shit scared to die and religion promises you're going to go to heaven and everything's going to be great. And that's why people have kids like that, you know, like, oh, I'll be dead, but my, my bloodline lives on. I've got a legacy. I'll still yeah. be alive. And then uh, there's us with our cameras, you know, I know. to leave Just, proof. <laughs> so we're going to, I'm going to pee real quick, but I want to talk about, we kind of talked a little bit about prank stuff. I got some other stuff I want to go into about sure, man. social media, but yeah, let me pee real quick. Yeah. I could talk about this life and death forever sure but i like i do want to i'll switch it up a little bit because i know people might be like bro stop talking about dying and shit. <laughs> um but dude okay you're obviously it's 2023 you're on the 
internet, you make content, you make podcasts. You started with like the jackass stuff. You guys created like a wave of pranksters, essentially that like I grew up, I was a little kid, literally watching your shit. Like I watched all the jackass. I mean, it was like everyone, any boy she, ever talked about this stuff at all. How come she's shaking like I don't that? know. She's probably hyped. Oh, okay. Yeah, let her out, let her out. So <clears throat> you you guys like created this wave, right? And and nowadays, I don't know if you what you've seen or if you watch people, but like people are taking like the prank thing, like specifically like TikTokers and like this like interview sequence type right. stuff to like a crazy level of Yeah, I think that like people are like hitting people. Like right. I saw some guy in Texas like just swung on someone and was like, oh, it's a prank. It's like, no, you just like assaulted someone. Right. So right. what's your take on like how people push? Cause like, cause nowadays to, to get noticed, you have to keep pushing the envelope and it's gotten so far and there's so many people <coughs> doing it that like, what's your opinion on that now? Knowing where you came um, from? I, I haven't had like any of that stuff come through my feed. You yeah. know? So like, I, I'm not uh, super aware of it, but um, I'll say this, that I, think of jackass as something that's genuinely wholesome and i know that that's counterintuitive because we're like hurting ourselves real bad like we're like you know being like super gnarly and 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 crazy but at the same time like for all the terrible things that we put ourselves and each other through like we want these things to be happening. So like, it's okay. Like yeah. we, we, we sign up for that stuff to happen. And because we want it to happen, that makes it okay for the viewer to enjoy watching it. Yeah. We're willing participants, but when it comes to third party people yeah, on Jackass, we have like profound respect for third party. There's no, there's nothing like malicious or mean spirited. We never target anybody to make them feel bad. We always have the joke is on us. Yeah. And that's like the the most important thing, you know? And and that's why I think Jackass is so so wholesome because the spirit of it is positive. We don't want anybody to feel bad. We want them to feel good about us feeling bad, but right. we're fine with it. It's yeah. okay. So anything where, you know, YouTube pranksters, like, I think a lot of the time they're just missing the point and the, and they're actually letting their, the spirit of their content be mean yeah, or malicious, you're you know, like, I just think that it's really, really important when you're creating content to uh, ask yourself, what is the spirit of what I'm doing? And, uh, you know, is this, am I being mean to people? You know, you don't want to be mean yeah. to people. Yeah, because it's different. It's just it's so different nowadays because people, like, compete to get the next thing. Sure. Like, the, the crazier thing, the crazier thing. Right. Yeah. And, like, now since it's, like, everyone, you know, has seen an opportunity on whether it be, like, TikTok or Instagram or YouTube, that people really push the envelope where it's, like, they, they, I think they miss that a lot. They they lose that because the joke's not on them. Like the joke will be on like a right. bystander that's innocent. I've actually been guilty of that <clears throat> myself, you know, and and I, I'll fully own up to it. And like, what's crazy too is that where I've where I've uh, been guilty of of uh, you know targeting people in a way that wasn't like a a positive spirit. Like those videos were wildly successful. You know, I had one. I had one called, I mean, I haven't never did anything that bad, but, um, I had one called, uh, the, I just find, I mean, in the sense of, I find it interesting that people like to see yeah. that sort of, right. Like uh, negative shit on other people. Right. I had one that it was called the golden shower prank. And in the middle of the summer down in San Diego, I went to like a super crowded beach with, uh, with, with what's called a whizinator. It's like a, 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 a it's like a fake that that you'll buy at the at the smoke shop it's so that you can uh, put like you know uh clean urine into it and then you go in to take a drug test it'll even have a thing to warm up I to, see. so that the urine's the right temperature and you so can, that's to beat test to beat drug 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, but it's like very realistic, you know, fake. In case someone's watching you. Right. Yeah. And, okay. and, and they will be. So I got that. I got the Wizenator, and I, I went out to the beach. I, I just put just clean water in the Wizenator, but like with a hidden camera. I went to went up to people who were uh, who were tanning. Tanning. Yeah, laying out on the beach. And I would just, and I pulled out my Wizenator and squirted just water out of it, like onto people, you know, onto yeah, fuck, that, oh, <laughs> like onto That's dudes, fun. like onto dudes, and they like, you know, they 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 feel the water, they, they feel that they're like face down, or whatever, they feel the water, and then they look up, and it's like they they got a guy with their the, the, with the wing, it's like peeing on them, yeah, they freak out, but like. 90% of the people, they looked up and they were like initially like really like shocked. And then they go, Steve-o. <laughs> yeah. So it was like kind of okay. And at the end, I did it on like a guy that was like not much smaller than you, like a yeah. big old dude. Did he try to fuck you up? He was ready to absolutely, he's like, take off your glasses. <laughs> and then he goes did you he, take them off yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, nice. and then he goes take off your shirt and then it's like you know and then he saw the tattoo on my back he goes dude i almost killed you you have it all on camera yeah it's on my youtube dude, channel so like where because i i know because i wait yeah and i'm sorry for cutting you off there, but uh knoxville i showed that to him and he was like man the spirit of this isn't right you know ah, and 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 and, and I put it up anyway. I put it up anyway, but like there was a, there was one guy who who did take it badly, and it wasn't like you know I th I, th I think I put him in the in the video too. Like yeah. there was one guy that just like didn't react well, and I put it in there. And then like as another example of where I, I would you know acknowledge that that I came up short was is just like the body on the ground prank where like I poured fake blood like all over myself and just went face down on the concrete, like on the sidewalk oh, and like shit. people come by and we get their reaction to like this body fake covered in blood face down on the sidewalk. They pull out their phone and then like somebody comes running over like, Hey, this isn't real. Like don't call 911. We just wanted to get your reaction. You know, that one's but tough. That one's really tough. And, yeah. and, uh, and it's like, it's, it's like, Top five. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, dude. Yeah, and at the end of it, like the, the like there's a cop in my like banging on my hotel room door and he goes, dude, like if you want to do this, man, maybe give us a heads up. But we got three fire trucks out there. We got like, you yeah. know, like yeah. so I'm not proud of that, dude. Yeah, I see. I, I'm I'm like pretty bummed on that. Like any time <laughs> that I'm that I've wasted uh like emergency responder yeah that sucks. you know res city resources for the tying up emergency responders like i am distinctly not proud of that yeah that makes sense um what what have been in your opinion what's the craziest thing that you've ever done that maybe people don't know about or like for you personally was like this was just maybe like you were so close to that line where you were like i shouldn't have done this not necessarily these ones that are yeah, Just, the, I mean, these ones I clearly shouldn't have. I mean, I don't know. The golden shower prank's not too bad. It's not too bad. You're going to get a bunch of kids on TikTok going to go find that and go piss on <laughs> people. Because, you know, a lot of stuff, it's interesting, man. Like, there's a lot of people will, like, watch old stuff and, like, do it now. Right. You know, because it's, yeah. it's not done now. It was done then. The golden shower prank is right on the line. I'm not bummed on that because... Uh, I mean, I'm I'm not like really too bummed on that. Um, they, it's because it didn't waste the time of emergency responders. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I shouldn't have done things that wasted the time of emergency responders. But uh, to answer your question, like the the craziest crazy stuff is what I just put out, dude. That yeah. thing I showed you. Yeah. And if you watch the first seven minutes, like it starts out like kind of tame, <laughs> you know, like it. Uh, I got up to the on the fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just, just completely ridiculous. Like right. there's one angle that I almost threw up. Like I, it's the right. down, it's the up angle. I was like, this is right. disgusting. You right. don't care about showing your at all. You give zero fucks. Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty mellow about it. Yeah. Um, and and the thing, like, like it, it was a tough call to, to put that the the hits the fan like so close to the front because it's like it's aggressive. Yeah. But, but the the reason why I had to is because the the bucket list items go in descending order of my fiance's approval and support. 
So like in the beginning, she's like front and center. She's like fully down. Like Got she's it. like, you know, she's like, yo, get get the shot. And my buddies are running for their lives and she's moving in for a better you, shot. Yeah, this is the poo in the fan. Do you remember when me and Steve came over to yeah, your yeah, house? Poo cannon, you, yeah, yeah. Did it was it your shit? It was about, it was my dog Wendy's. And you and you shot it like a potato cannon, like at it, you. not a potato cannon, a t shirt cannon, a t shirt cannon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was and Jacob was filming the guy who's back yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was like I I got shit on me. The fact of me not having an earplug in my ear when I did that was like completely ridiculous. Because you really like did you I blew so I, I blew a hole in my eardrum. <laughs> I literally blew a hole in my eardrum, dude. Like it, uh, I was not okay. <laughs> I just remember you are in your front yard and you had like didn't you also have like gallons of piss yeah, stored yeah, yeah, yeah. for some yeah that was for the bucket list dude that's so, like uh, that I was saving up for a world record and it's in the bucket list so special. so so I I love this I'm gonna watch the rest of this when, when this is done but like were these all things that you couldn't put in any jackasses like how did this work did for, for the most part yeah the um like uh it's just, you saw in the beginning, I, I talked about, like, you know, as an example of my bucket list, like, yeah. uh, skydiving. I was, the yeah, guy yeah. on your back, yeah. Yeah, like, you can't blow on camera in Jackass. So, this, so that one, like, when, um, you also, like, for Jackass, we can't, like, just blatantly break the law. And, like, there, there's a couple of things in the bucket list where um, medical professionals stole things from the hospital like one, uh, like I, I had general anesthesia pumped into an IV in my arm while I'm riding a bicycle through a field, which is like, oh, to see how long you could ride it. Yeah, for. just to be like, Let, let's knock me out while I'm hauling out on a bicycle. You know, like uh, is that that's in the video you saw? Uh, yeah, I have to yeah. Watch this and then there's another one. You know what an epidural is? Yeah. They stick a four inch needle in your spinal cavity and inject, it, which paralyzes you. So they pull out the four inch needle out of my spine and I take off running to see how far I can go. You're not worried these things are gonna like f you up ever? Those those were both like legitimately life threatening stunts. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like Yeah. You, I mean I had medical professionals in disguise, which which helped, you know. For the general anesthesia one, we actually um hired a, a private ambulance. So we had like an ambulance there and the ambulance people had no idea what was even happening. They didn't even know why they were there. We're like, look, we're not going to tell you what's happening. We're just going to call you if we need Cause that it. one's like directly, like you're breaking all kinds of shit. Oh, everybody's, everybody's lost their careers in going to jail. And like, yeah. I could absolutely have died because generally anesthesia drugs make you stop breathing. Yeah. If you yeah. go in surgery, they jam a tube down your throat because your respiratory system shuts down. Yeah. So you, you just like, <laughs> you just have no, like, you literally don't fear. You're just like, fuck it. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I was on a mission to raise the bar. Yeah. And so I filmed all of these different things. And um, after I filmed each thing, I, I'd go to the local comedy club and, uh, like, tell the story of the bit, like, you know, like, how it came about. You know, I'd work out the material. Yeah. And then ultimately I put them all together into one show. And uh, it's the bucket list, and after each bit, I show the video of the thing. Yeah, I, I I literally watched I think about seven minutes of it. I loved it. Yeah, so my thanks, question to you, man. my question to you about it, just that those concepts and just all your concepts or like ideas or pranks in general, was it is it always of your own like creation, or did you have For a the team most part. or? Like when you did a lot of the stuff in Jackass, was it like you being like the things that you did were they like your ideas? Um, what, what you can be sure of for the most part, there's a, there's only one exception to this that, that I can even think of. Um, if you see somebody doing something on Jackass, you know, either they came up with the idea or they were given permission, uh, to do it by the person who did come up with the idea. Okay. Like intellectual property is something that's gotten like, like true respect. It's like the only thing that got respect, you know, like, yeah. and, um, a lot of the times, like, uh, people write ideas for, oh, I got one for you, you know, I got one for you. Like, uh, yeah. so if, if anything I did on camera, either I came up with the idea or I was given permission to, to do it by the person who did come up with the idea. And in a lot of cases, the idea they specifically came up with for me. So, you know. Yeah, I see. Uh, but yeah, if you give, like, uh, <clears throat> 
the, the, the goldfish was like the first thing that was like, and I had been sitting on that idea for like over a year. I thought that swallowing a goldfish and barfing it up into a fishbowl was just going to be a banger, and I was saving it for the right project, like the right big skateboard video or whatever. Yeah. And uh, and and yeah, I saved it for what what became Jackass, and yeah. and it was fucking. Was that rad. one of the? What was one of the most viral bits you've done for Jackass specifically? <clears throat> uh, for Jackass, the uh, the goldfish was the first one that was a big deal. Um, body waxing like where i got my eyebrows waxed off was a big deal and then in the first movie uh the alligator tightrope was a big one the wasabi snooters was a big one the second movie i had the the fish hook where they cast me out with the sharks yeah, well, well, didn't we someone a, we, get? We put a fish hook through my face, and i was on a fishing line and i jump in the water and like they're like fishing for sharks with me and <laughs> and that one was not my idea actually you know what the of those ones i just mentioned the goldfish was my idea i was put up to the well you know what i i did come up with the the waxing but i i, I said let me get my armpits waxed and they were they got me and didn't the fucking yeah, do the whole thing uh see so yeah, i came up with that one too alligator tightrope was never my idea they just had they just knew that there was an alligator pit in the everglades um the uh, wasabi snooters i can't remember and snooters was like my term for for a uh, snorting like let me get a snooter you know like give me a line of <laughs> yeah um can't remember if i came up with that or not Who and got the, the, the the fish hook was not yeah yeah who got most hurt like what who's got the most hurt on one of these uh didn't that wasn't there like some shark thing where someone got bit? yeah poopies yeah yeah that, that's that's absolutely the worst and i wasn't about to come up with that one either like yeah that's definitely the worst his hand is fucked for life yeah like he he can like i i don't i forget what his limitations are but like yeah his hand's never going to be the same so out of out of like all the the people on jackass i think so it's like in my opinion it seemed the people who went uh, I guess the furthest it would be you in, in Knoxville, right? Yeah, Knoxville by far, I think the the farthest, the biggest risks. Yeah. Because he's getting in front of bulls and yeah. You know, like yeah, was it was it was was like it was Jackass like his idea? It, you can't really say that it was anybody's idea. Like we were all like most of us were brought together by that skateboard magazine, Big Brother. Yeah. And we were uh, you know, we, we we all found Big Brother because we were doing this type of thing. Yeah. Big Brother just kind of like brought us together. And, uh, you know, then there was Bam, and he was doing his CKY videos, which was a similar dynamic, you know, yeah. like take out the skateboarding. And um, so, yeah, I'd say that we were all doing this kind of stuff in our own right. Why did know? it seem like Knoxville got the most popularity from it? Um because Knoxville was absolutely the main guy, the face of it, uh, a creator of it. He, uh, the, you know, the actual deal happening um, was because Spike Jones and Jeff Tremaine and Johnny Knoxville brought it in. Got it. To, uh, you know, to the boardrooms where the MTV, you All know, the did, so they got the deal. Yeah, okay. They got the deal. They're the executive producers, the creators, the, you know. They Do you ever wish that it. you were more involved in that part, that process? Um, I mean, sure. You know, you, you, you wish that you had more uh, power, prestige, and money. <laughs> you know? um, but um, I don't second guess a damn thing. You know, yeah. I'm like, and, and, and I've never felt like, uh, you know, resentful or, or jealous of Knoxville for being the, the main guy, like the, the face of it, because without, you know, like it would be to, to root against Knoxville for me would be like the definition of cut off your nose to spite your face. Yeah. It's, you know, it makes sense. it's because Knoxville was so like such a, a beautiful handsome man like leading man <laughs> looks and like the care the charisma and like and, and everything that, that he did like the huge yeah. risks that he took like he absolutely uh is the captain you know yeah, and i sure. call him captain 
Yeah. And and uh like without him being everything that he is and all of the the you know success that he's had, like yeah, you know, I never would have got anywhere. So yeah. You definitely like from my perspective, you definitely were like the I would say you were like crowd like fan favorite though. Like you I grew mean, that really quickly. Yeah, I don't I, I'm not trying like, to like create I you know? I, I, I uh you know I I'm, I love the kind words and, yeah. and I'm grateful. I think uh, like different people uh, maybe gravitate to, you know, I'd certainly Bam was like, wild. Bam as well, yeah. Bam was like the, you know, I, I, Bam really gave Knoxville a run for his money as yeah, far as 100%. like, you know, the Viva La Bam days and like, yeah. you know, Bam was, was uh, absolutely, it was really just those two, you for know, sure. and I was like a distant third. Um, and, and whatever, man, I'm, I'm fine with it. Like, yeah. uh, I just, you know, if anything, you know, like in the beginning of my career, I, I did not have sophisticated representation. I, I did not get good contracts. I had, uh, you know, like I, I really, I like what representation I did have was uh, like really quite unprofessional yeah. people who, who, uh, arguably like pretty badly took advantage of me. Yeah. And, I and, say that's you know, pretty common in that industry too. For sure. Like, like when, when Jackass was, was just a TV show, I was already on uh, like a base of what would become a world tour, you know, like it was the don't try this at home tour. Yeah. And uh, what I know about touring now, like when I, what I, what I know about the, the economics, the business of touring. Yeah tells me you got back then, yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah i got really really is, is is what i think and i i don't have any uh resentment any anything if anything i i genuinely feel grateful that i was not paid like what i should have been getting paid back then why because because it, it, I don't think it would have been very good for me to have like uh, all kinds of money at my disposal in that at, at that time. That's not a very good reason. But like where I sit today, like I've had a career, an absurd career, which like by all rights should never have even begun. Yeah. And I've had it for like more than 23 years now. Yeah. And the fact that my career has endured for this long is like just lightning in a bottle. And the craziest part about it is that I've maintained a largely upward trajectory. Yeah. You know, like I, uh, like I, I didn't make it in the beginning and then like just gradually got a little bit, you know, and like, it's pretty awesome to, uh, to think like, man, like I've been on an upward trajectory. I'm pushing 50 years old and yeah. like, you know, but like I have this one friend because th th there have been like peaks and valleys a little bit. I know in 2013, I was like in a pretty dark place. Like Knoxville was, uh, was filming the bad grandpa movie. And I was like, dude, they're making a jackass movie without the jackass guys. Like, I we, see. you know, we got Timberlake over here. Like, you know, <laughs> oh, no. like now I'm the Jackson four, like, fuck. Like it felt like it, it was, it was dark, man. And I was just starting out in comedy and I didn't know how well that was going to go. And, um, I just felt like I was done. I felt like I was done. Then 2013 is when I like, I was literally in this terrible dark place and, and, uh, to keep my sanity, I made my first YouTube video. Yeah. I didn't think there was any money in making YouTube videos. I thought it was just like a terrible demotion from being a big movie star. Yeah. But I was just like, screw it. I'm just going to do it. The best movie I ever made. Yeah. But uh, at that time, um, I had a buddy of mine who was like, dude, Steve-O, you haven't even peaked yet. And this was like, this was like this guy's my, my buddy, Adam Jablin. Yeah. Best dude. And he's like, dude, you haven't even peaked yet, dude. And I just didn't believe it. And I was like, oh, yeah, he's just trying to be a good bro. And like, he just kept saying it and saying it. And like, at a certain point, I started believing it, you know, like, like, dude, I'm on, I'm on my way up still. You know, I haven't even peaked yet. Like, I kind of feel like 2022 might have, <laughs> 2022 was huge. Yeah. For me, it was huge. It was yeah. 2022 was huge. Yeah. And now, like, uh, 
I don't know, dude. I don't know. But I think that what I got to do is move the goalposts on some level and be like, hey, I got to let go of of like basing my my self-worth on like how much money I'm earning, how many views I'm getting, you know, because like if my self-worth is tied to how many views I'm getting and how much money I'm earning, then eventually it's like, it's, it's all, be, it's going to be all bad. Yeah. hundred percent. So I gotta, I have to like separate myself from that and assign my self-worth, my identity, my, my quality of life to my relationships, you yeah. know? That's like, and that's a tall order, but if, if, if you, I mean, if you, you know, this is a stupid theoretical question, but if you knew everything you knew right now today, would you go back and do things differently? I mean, back to the future taught me not to mess with the space time <laughs> <Yeah>. continuum, <Yeah. laughs> <Fair. laughs> you know, yeah. like I wouldn't want to mess with the space time continuum. And like, he, he, here's a good example of, of where like that would be a problem is that, uh, like very recently, like one of my ideas for a YouTube video was to recreate a bunch of iconic jackass bits, you know, to do stunts that were like huge on jackass and like kind of just see what it would be like to do them like 20 years later. Yeah. You know? And uh, I did seven of them. It was the goldfish, the worm trick, um, like wasabi snooters, butt piercing, um, paper cuts, and uh, and T ball and the butt chug, the butt chug is yeah. so. And and and, and uh, I lined them up, and and knocked them down back to back in like the space of like an hour and a half, like two hours. <laughs> and like, it's it's just really really striking to think like, man, you know, I just got all that done so fast. And it was it was interesting. It was fascinating. But like knowing that it was done a long time ago, like there, I don't know. Like I feel like any version of like going back armed with the knowledge, you know. Like imagine like I've got uh, these last twenty three years of like ideas that came up organically over the time to go back and have all those ideas. Like what would I just like line them up and knock them down and be like, okay, what you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, it's, 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 it's a weird thing to think of, but, um, but yeah, there's something special about, about just the way it happened, dude. Yeah. I mean, that is that, that yeah. I mean, that's the thing, you know, people talk about the idea of like fate or like things being the way they're oh, dude, supposed to be. Hundred percent. It's interesting. Cause it's like, yeah, like everything is that way. Like, even if you went back, it's like, it wouldn't yeah. exactly be the same, but I just find that concept really, really interesting. The idea of fate. Because what we Dude. choose, no matter what, is Me fate. too. Me too. And the thing is that um, it, I've been really, really tripping out lately on uh, synchronicity. Been like watching like YouTube videos about synchronicity and like and and fate like kind of goes into that a lot. That like on some level, I believe. Like things are what things are supposed to happen, like the kind of the way they're supposed to happen. Yeah. And no matter how much I bang my head against the wall trying to force something to happen, like it's, maybe it's just not in the cards, you know. And we can let go of a lot of stress and anxiety by just like kind of going with the flow, you yeah. know. Like I think that and and the difference there is in. Uh, like it is in following your intuition, like following like what, like what you're passionate about, you know, and and the let letting like kind of the universe guide you. It's a yeah. tall order, man. And it I'll is. never be I'll never be able to do it. But like it does give me comfort to think, hey man, what's supposed to happen is gonna happen. Yeah, and, and the cool thing about it too is that like the idea that we we're talking about earlier, you. Like when you had nothing and you were, you know, you I'm had stoked. Every, yeah, I'm yeah. Stoked. it's, it's that same concept. Yeah. It's like, you're just doing what feels best or yeah. what you believe will, you know, make you happiest. And then all the stuff started, the money, the things started coming yeah. from it. And so when you have the money, you're like, I got to make sure this and that. And right. it's like, how can you have it, but live in that? Right. It's okay. Whatever happens state. 
Yeah. And that's how I think you continue to grow. And because the reality is, if you spent all your days being like, I'm so worried about this, you're just going to get more of that energy right. back For instead sure. of like, I'm, I'm, I'm going yeah. to live in this state where I'm at now and whatever happens, happens. I'm going to try my best. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to show up and like be happy and try to f stay there. Then like you keep getting more of the good instead of more of just the, what you're, oh, right. I don't want this to happen. Right. And it, it, like, it's so, tr it's so true, man. And there have been times when, when I was uh, like, I really felt like I was banging my head against a wall trying to force something to happen and it just wasn't happening. And like, and like at one time I, I wrote a, a script for, for a movie, which would be like a, a, a scripted movie, but in it I could do all these, like I wrote all these crazy stunts into it and stuff. And like, like nobody cared, nobody like, like I just wouldn't, nobody cared. And I was trying, so I cared so much and I was so stressed about it. And there are other times when I was like trying to like pitch TV shows to networks and they just didn't care. Like nobody cared, you know? Yeah. And it was just like all of this uh, effort and all of this like just willing and trying to force it to happen just wasn't working. And, and it just got me like to a point of like despair, you know, yeah. to a point of despair where I was just like depressed and I was bummed. And then finally, like in both cases, I was like, dude, like I can't, like the, 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 the depression, the anxiety is just too much. I can't bear it anymore. I'm literally just gonna like, just, just let go of it and just turn all of my, I'm just gonna turn all of my attention to just my world of recovery. Just like all this, you know, just like my, my recovery stuff. I'm just gonna focus on that. And every time that I just focus on my recovery stuff, everything else works out. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how the thing you resist the most, like just keeps persisting. Sure. And, and, um, and, and for people who aren't in recovery, like I would just say like, like this, and, and, and this applies to me more than anything. And I've, this has been at the forefront of my, of my thinking, like my, the forefront of my consciousness is that like when, when I'm, when I'm scared that like, oh man, my op like what I'm trying to make happen isn't going to happen or what I worked on, it isn't going well or like whatever. Like, you know, I'm like, like or I'm hemorrhaging money because like the, the, the overhead with my business is so high. Like right. all of these different things that I can focus on in my mind and, and feel like scared or just negative and, and bummed. Like whenever I'm in that place, it's like, let me ask myself, who could I shoot a text to? Just to be like, yo, man, just thinking of you and like uh, just wishing you well, you know, like who can I like call up and just to get them stoked, you know, like, like what, how could I reach out to somebody in a way that like they're actually, I'm going to make their day better. And like, it's so, it's just so cliche and it's so, but it's, there's such supreme value in that. Even making a list, like if you think of something, oh man, it would like, if I, if I reached out to somebody, if I reached out to this one person and told them that, or if I had said, oh, hey, man, I've got something for you, and if I gave something to somebody, like whenever you have that thought and like have a little notepad, like, oh, I'm going to stoke this person out, stoke that. If you, just, if you just get someone stoked, then like that obliterates like the, the fear and the anxiety. Yeah. And that's back, back to the whole one. interconnected yeah. oneness, you know, like... Like, uh, it, it helps you in, in practical terms in this moment if you just think, I'm going to get somebody stoked. And then in your life review, you don't just experience the awful shit you did to people. You experience the good shit, too. Yeah. And people say that in their near-death experiences a lot, that, that uh, you know, the bad stuff, like, especially because you have a spirit guide, like, bring you through that you're there. And then people are like, oh, my God, I was so embarrassed, so ashamed that the spirit guide is sitting here, like, experiencing on this life review with me but it was rad that i had done more good stuff than bad stuff yeah bro this is this has been fucking incredible man yeah well, like, dude thank you man i honestly didn't know that i was where we're, i was gonna have this sort of like conversation like so deep with you but like you it makes sense you know it's, i mean it's it, it's uh like very much like where i'm at like it, it you know i've, I've been uh, it's very therapeutic for me to like voice like uh things that are bothering me, things I'm afraid of, like, yeah. and I feel really comfortable having done so. Yeah.
And, and I, I just think it's a really good thing for people to hear too, because there's no way anyone's going to make it through with their whole life and never be in similar situations, not necessarily financially or whatever, but it's like this whole concept of like resistance of the things that I want right. to accomplish or I want to achieve is right. relevant to everyone forever. Dude, negative self-talk is so destructive, dude. Yeah. And, I'm, and, I, and I don't even know how to, how to like try to dismantle it. You know, the only thing is like negative self-talk. It's like, okay, look, just like, I can't undo it because I want it. It's like, I just gotta be like, okay, acknowledging that I'm in the middle of negative self-talk, like, let me just do something positive separate, you know, yeah. let me just get somebody stoked. Yeah. And I try, like, for me, I try to like, I mean, obviously meditation is the way that I do this, but like, I'll try to not necessarily catch the thoughts to reverse them, but I'll just try to be mindful of my, of my actual thoughts and be like, okay, let me switch it to something else and like, yeah. let it go and relax. But it's, it, but it was a blessing speaking to you, man. Like, and, well, thanks, and, I, man. and I really, really actually did. And at the seven minutes that I saw, I really did enjoy the show. I'm going to watch Thank the you. rest of it when we're done. It's unbelievably f***ed up and, yeah. and entertaining. I'm not kidding. Like, I'm not kidding when I said I saw that second yeah. shot and I wanted to throw Dude, it up. Gets, it just does nothing but get crazier, the whole show. Like, if, if you're a fan of Jackass and you're like, wow, like, now I'm going to watch a whole show of shit that was like too f up for jackass then like that's what it is yeah and 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 like the fact of how it goes in descending order of my fiance's approval and support is meaningful because like by the end of it like these stunts are straight putting my relationship to the test in <laughs> very real ways yeah and uh like our relationship endured that and like and it's a love story you know it's a love story and like i said to you man i gotta let go of of uh like my identity and my self-worth being tied to my success with money and fame yeah. and i gotta turn to my relationships and like i genuinely put so much in my relationship with my fiance and it's all up in this this bucket list show and she, my fiance was the production designer too she came up with the idea for all the tv sets that was honestly dope as f yeah i was like i honestly think it was like who did whose idea was this my and the production was great too yeah it was like, not cheap man yeah no it was yeah it looked like a it's like a like a legit legit production special yeah for sure man and, and and dude thank you for helping me get the word out about it because uh there was never a chance that this was gonna make it on netflix it's too fucked up no way you know no yeah, way it's no not way. going on netflix it's not going on youtube and so like i gotta like like really really pound the pavement and try to get the word out yeah for it. are and you I, so where are you selling it it's at stevo.com okay cool. at my website yeah and uh yeah like everybody please do go enjoy this up ass special it's got some up overhead too so you guys gotta support <laughs> all right we gotta get this man right yeah yeah but dude thank you man absolutely dude. bless you man yeah oh, yeah dude likewise awesome. man thank sure. you so much um, make sure you guys subscribe to the channel every Tuesday, 11 a.m. I love you guys. Uh, we're on iTunes. We're on Spotify. We're everywhere. Drop a, drop a comment. Drop a like. See you guys next time.